All right. Well, hello, class, and welcome back to part B of lecture three. In part A, we introduced uh, the eccentricity vector, which was not a physical invariant of the system, nor was it really a, an orbit, uh, orbital element of the system, uh, but something in between. However, we certainly used it to derive our first orbital element, which is eccentricity. So specifically this little circle, little E right there. <clears throat> and based on that, we defined our second orbital element, again, based on the eccentricity vector, which is the vector which points in the direction of the periaps. I uh, will talk about periaps in a second. And the true anomaly, being our second orbital element, is the angle that the uh, position vector makes with that eccentricity vector. So we found an expression for uh, that angle, and we used it to derive the uh, very famous polar equation. So the polar equation is a essentially a parameterization of an ellipse in two dimensions using polar coordinates, where the, uh, the coordinates are distance, of course radius, in scalar form, not vector form, and the true anomaly f. So we have a, a expression for distance as a function of true anomaly. And I claimed that this sweeps out an ellipse. I didn't prove it, but you can take my word for it, I suppose. Within that, armed with that polar equation, now we, in this part B of the lecture, we uh, derive a lot of interesting formulae and talk a quite a bit about the ellipse and various commonly used uh, notions of geometric properties of that ellipse. And furthermore, we, uh, we introduce our third orbital element, which is a semi-major axis. We'll get to that in a minute. And again, we finalize this relationship between these invariant physical quantities, specifically angular momentum and energy, and the parameters of the ellipse, which will be semi-major axis and eccentricity. So we'll help show how to go back and forth between those two quantities. This semi this uh, angular momentum now being in scalar format, not, a, not as a vector. Right, so before we get to a, a whole bunch of equations, useful equations, equations you'll find very helpful when doing the homework, for example, uh, we'll take a brief moment and um, just verify some of the assertions that I made earlier in the lecture. And there, once, you're, once you have the polar equation, you know, these are really quite simple. Uh, so if we look at this expression, the polar equation here, uh, it's very clear to us now, at least uh, when uh, E is uh, less than 1, what the smallest value of R is. Where, where, when is the radius smallest as measured from the focal point of the ellipse? So remember, this is distance to the planet, and so we can find out, remember, these, this, is, this is constant, this is constant, this is constant, the only thing that's varying here is f. And so and if you want to get the smallest value of r, the value of f you look for is the one which is, well, which makes the denominator largest. So to get your smallest value of r, you look for the largest value of the denominator. And when is the denominator uh, largest? Well. We have a one term here, plus e, e is, a, e is a positive number, and times cosine of f, which if we all remember cosine, what that looks like, looks like that, right? varying between 0 and 2 pi. And so what is the largest value of cosine f? Well, it's just 1, and it occurs when f is 0, or f equals 2 pi, which is the same point. So the denominator is largest when f is 0, 
which means that r is smallest when f is f is zero, and so the the radius is smallest when you're pointing in the direction of the eccentricity vector, which verifies our assertion made earlier that the eccentricity vector points towards the periapse, the closest point on the orbit. Okay. So that's relatively straightforward. Um, when e is less than one, right, this denominator uh, never becomes zero, and so we uh, sweep out an ellipse as we go through uh, f from zero to two pi. Uh, I haven't, again, proved that ellipse, elliptical motion, this is Kepler's first law, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's commonly known and relatively easy to verify if you are interested in doing so. Um, another thing to, uh, of interest here is that when the eccentricity is zero, right, then this entire term disappears. And the, we, uh, the expression simply becomes r, which is a function of t, but it actually isn't, is just equal to h squared over mu. So that the, uh, the, the distance from the uh, central body is a constant. Uh, specifically, it's a circle, right? The orbit sweeps out a circle as you change f. Uh, again, <clears throat> not particularly surprising since eccentricity, we generally think of it as deviations from a circle, and so if there's no deviation, you have a circular orbit. We'll talk a little bit more about circular orbits later in this part of the lecture. Uh, and finally, we can uh, extend this, uh, this statement here on the periapse uh, by plugging in the value of f equals zero and obtain an expression for the distance of closest approach on the orbit, which is just h squared over mu over one plus e for an elliptic orbit. And actually this holds also for a hyperbolic orbit as well, as well as a parabolic orbit for that matter, actually. So a couple easy relationships that we can get right off the bat just by looking at the polar equation. Uh, did I miss anything here? So in, the, in, in part C of this lecture, we'll uh, revisit the uh, Kepler's second and third laws and prove those separately. And uh, let's see, yeah, we'll, we'll go on. Um, now again, the polar equation, again, I bother repeating the polar equation. The polar equation holds both for elliptic, parabolic, and hyperbolic orbits. So it's not particular to elliptic orbits uh, as Kepler used it, but uh, it holds for all three of them. So let's uh, just take this polar equation and plug in a few values to get certain uh, useful relationships. Right. So the first point we'll take is uh, the value of f equals pi over 2, so true anomaly pi over 2, which is, of course, uh, 90 degrees. We could also plug in uh, negative 90 degrees, but let's, let's not confuse the matter. So what happens at uh, 90 degrees? So we don't actually have an ellipse here, so I'll go ahead and draw one. Here's our ellipse. Here's our focal point, which is a central body. Here's the eccentricity vector, and now here we have uh, r when f equals 90 degrees. So there's a, it's a right angle there. So what is, this, uh, what is the value of distance there at that point? Well, we can just plug into the, uh, uh, if you remember what cosine looks like as you go, right, along the uh, 0 to 2 pi, uh, f equals pi over 2, uh, the value of cosine at f equals pi over 2 is just 0. So at f equals pi over 2, uh, this term just becomes 0, and we have r equals h squared over mu. So a couple things to note, right? Of course, this is not a, a circular orbit. That's, that was the radius for a circular orbit. Um, it doesn't, va doesn't vary with eccentricity. So eccentricity doesn't factor into this, into this semi-lattice rectum, is what it's called. Why is it called the semi-lattice rectum? Here we have a, uh, it's a kind of a funny name. Um, so the, uh, the, the semi-lattice rectum is, uh, it gets its name from uh, 
uh, rectum, meaning uh, right angle, and lattice, me, with this interpreting as width, and half of the width because it doesn't. This is, would be the entire lattice rectum; it goes all the way. And this is a semi lattice rectum; it only goes half of the way. So the semi lattice rectum then is the uh, distance at a right angle it makes to the ellipse. The um, the orbit makes to the ellipse. <clears throat> This, uh, as I said, this is a, an important quantity, and it doesn't vary with um, uh, eccentricity. So it's independent of eccentricity. So often, actually, in describing ellipses, uh, we can parameterize the ellipse with A and E, uh, but sometimes we also use uh, P and E, right? Uh, so the semi-lattice rectum and eccentricity. It's a less common uh, parameterization of ellipse, but equally valid. Uh, we don't use P and E as much because there's not quite as much stuff we can do with P, uh, but there are good reasons to uh, to use P and E, not A and E, um, which I won't talk about right now. So it's often referred to as the parameter of the ellipse hyperbolic. Not shouldn't really be the parameter because really there are two parameters, uh, P and E. Uh, if we combined it with A, however, uh, there's there's a good reason to use that parameterization in that we see here that we can get P, this parameter, directly from the angular momentum. So if we have angular momentum, we just go straight up and determine our, our semi-lattice rectum. We'll show later on that given energy, you can go straight to a semi-major axis as well. And so sometimes this is a useful way of parameterizing the ellipse because you can go uh, right back and forth between these physical invariants um, Uh, H and E, and the uh, geometric invariants P and A. Um, so that's the semi-lattice rectum, very important uh, quantity. We'll, we'll see it a lot. It'll come back. Oh, I should also mention that the semi-lattice rectum is also, of course, defined uh, in the same way for hyperbolae as, uh, as well as ellipses. So there's no ambiguity there. The, Semi-lattice rectum means exactly the same thing for hyperbola here. Uh, it's just the, uh, right, we measure f slightly differently there. Um, so again, semi-lattice rectum, this formula applies to both ellipses and hyperbola. Okay, so uh, now we've got semi-lattice rectum. Now we've got uh, eccentricity. Let's, uh, let's keep going. Uh, I mentioned earlier, right, uh, the point of periapse, right? So let's go ahead and uh, talk about periapse a little bit. Um, so as I mentioned, periapse is the point of closest approach. We, we showed that on uh, two slides ago. And it coincides with the uh, point at which the true anomaly is zero. So it's, uh, this is the eccentricity vector. It corresponds to the point where the position vector coincides with the eccentricity vector, so Rp. And we'll give it a little name, R sub p there, uh, radius at periapse. A couple, uh, a couple notes on uh, the naming criterion. Uh, so periapse uh, is when you don't know what you're orbiting. It's, it, periapse applies to any orbit uh, you want to, to, to consider. Uh, however, in the sort of uh, nomenclature or literature or what have you, there are actually various names uh, for, various specialized names for this point uh, because it's such an important point uh, for different orbits based on the central body. <clears throat> so the thing you're orbiting is, of course, the central body. Uh, the one you're probably most familiar with is perigee, right? Uh, G for G Gaia, or a G, the Greek word for, for, for Earth. <clears throat> so this uh, perigee uh, only applies to orbits about the Earth. So uh, perigee is the point of closest approach to the Earth in your orbit. <clears throat> this formula uh, we have, we've given up here, right? Uh, just uh, by plugging in f equals zero. Uh, now we've uh, expressed it in h squared over mu, but let's go ahead and get rid of the h squared over mu so that 
our physical invariants disappear, and we're only thinking now in terms of our geometric parameters. <clears throat> so specifically, we can define the periaps, uh, define it if you want to call it that, uh, as the ratio of the semilattice rectum over 1 plus e. So that's how we're going to define the, the periaps. And the, the concept of periaps actually applies to both uh, hyperbolic and parabolic and elliptic orbits. So I say all orbits up here for the three different cases. And so this formula works for either, any of those. Uh, within those three orbits, right, all of these concepts are well defined. Uh, we can extend the orbit to other central bodies. Uh, the most common are, well, the, probably the second most common uh, that you'll encounter is uh, perihelion. That, so that's uh, closest approach about the sun. So if you have, say, uh, some Halley's Comet or something, it has a perihelion, which is the point at closest approach to the sun, and it usually breaks up somewhere around here. Here's my comet. <clears throat> uh, we uh, have other terms. Um, the perilune for lunar orbits, I guess that's the third, probably the third most common. Uh, so point of closest approach for lunar orbits. I can keep going. Um, so you, you might detect a trend uh, in, the, in, the, in these names. So the uh, closest approach to Mercury is uh, perihermion. Uh, so uh, Mercury is, of course, the uh, Roman name for the, uh, the god Mercury. And then Hermes is the Greek name. Uh, we can extend that to Saturn. Uh, the closest approach to Saturn is Perisythe. Uh, we actually deviate here from this ion thing for some reason. Uh, so uh, extending to Mars, that's a very, another common one. But you don't hear this name very much. Uh, Periarion uh, for Aries, being the, the Greek version of the god. Uh, closest approach to Jupiter, Perijove for Jove. Uh, wait, why do I have? Oh, sorry, this is this is a mistake. Uh, this is Venus. So my bad. Perisythe is the closest approach to Venus. So typo there. <clears throat> the uh, closest approach to Saturn is Perichron for Kronos, uh, otherwise known as Perisaturnium if you prefer the Romans. Uh, Uranus, uh, Uranus, uh, Periuranian. <clears throat> Uh, Neptune, Periposidian for Posidus, Poseidon, uh, Pluto, uh, Perihadion uh, for closest approach to a, a generic star, not necessarily the Sun, Periastron. Uh, we can extend this uh, the closest to point to the center of the galaxy, Perigalacticon. And uh, my personal favorite, uh, the uh, closest approach to a black hole, <clears throat> uh, Peribothron. Although uh, some people use perimelasma, which I think is not in keeping. Melasma is the, uh, I believe, French word for black. Uh, whereas bothron, bothros is a, is whole in Greek. So the uh, uh, closest point to a hole. <clears throat> I like bothron because it always reminds me of that scene in, uh, in, uh, in Star Wars where uh, the uh, ca Admiral, um, what's, what's her face? Um, is telling us uh, telling the about the weakness in the Death Star, and she says, "Many Bothans died to bring us this information." Sounds very, it always sounds very, uh, um, I don't know, dramatic or something like that. But I, but when I heard that, I always thought I was thinking, "Many Bothrans died to bring bring us this information." So I was thinking like these were little hill people or something burrowed into the Empire. Uh, but no, apparently not. It's Bothra Bothan. I, I don't know Bothans. Bothrons sounds kind of similar. Uh, <clears throat> finally, uh, a, a very special case uh, is the uh, the closest point of the orbit of the moon around the Earth, and that uh, that periapse is actually called uh, the proxygy. Uh, so if you here's the Earth, here's the moon. Um, its orbit it, it, its orbit is slightly elliptic. And uh, its closest to point is the uh, is the proxygy, and it turns out when the uh, periapse of the moon and the sun are aligned, you get the, uh, a special uh, kind of tide where the, the gravity of the moon and the sun add up, 
uh, creating an especially high tide, uh, which occurs at Proxigy, very ra rather rare tide. Uh, we don't see it very often. <clears throat> anyway, a little bit of de 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 detail right there. Again, all of those uh, those terms on the previous slide apply to arbitrary orbits because there's always a point of closest approach. Uh, conversely, here at for Apo apps uh, or Apogee or Aphelion, just add app to any of those <clears throat> suffixes you saw in the previous slide. Um, only applies to elliptic orbits. Right? Uh, why does it only apply to elliptic orbits? I mean, that's fairly obvious. If you have a hyperbolic orbit where you escape the uh, gravity well, <clears throat> then there's no no point at which you're farthest away from the from the central body and hence uh, this would be infinity if it existed and it, of course we, we don't define things you know, which are infinite uh, in any case uh, so in the special case of elliptic orbits we can we can determine this uh, this information and this occurs of course uh, again if we look at the polar equation which I have not copied and pasted here uh, I'll just grab it from this side. All right, so if we look at this equation now, uh, we can see that when f is equal to pi or 180 degrees, well, if we look at the value of cosine function, what happens at uh, 180 degrees, uh, cosine f is negative 1. And so we've split the sign of this term on the denominator. So it's now 1 minus e. And so that's as small as this denominator gets, at least for elliptic orbits. Um, of course, for, for a hyperbolic or a parabolic orbit, there will be a point where this denominator is 0. But that's not the case for elliptic orbits. Uh, so we can define now, again, the, this point of apoapse for elliptic orbits uh, to be this point at true anomaly 180 degrees. We just plug it in and we get this expression here, right, uh, where we flip the sign on the E. And uh, let's express it using our geometric parameter, uh, semi-lattice rectum over 1 minus E. All right. So clearly this is the, uh, the point of uh, farthest uh, reach on an elliptic orbit, as we just uh, argued right there. Uh, I like, again, periapse, it's uh, specific to the central body, so don't misuse, don't say apogee when you're talking about orbits around the sun, for example. Uh, that would be aphelion. Uh, you, you often see these, these mis, uh, misstatements in the literature. I often, I, recently, last year, I think I saw one in the New York Times for uh, uh, the uh, closest approach to a black hole was actually uh, mislabeled as apog uh, perigee uh, when I just, well, that's, that's a big mistake. You shouldn't really be doing that. Um, but anyway, I won't harp on the New York Times too much. So now we've got apoapse, we've got periapse, um, and now I think we are ready to define our third orbital element, which is semi-major axis. So semi-major axis is a little bit tricky because it's not actually defined in terms, or we're not going to define it in terms of that ellipse because semi-major axis applies to both ellipses and hyperbolae. It doesn't apply to parabolae because uh, in a parabola, it's actually infinity. Um, so... We're not going to, we don't really consider the semi-major axis of a parabola. Uh, so how are we going to define the semi-major axis? We actually, we define it uh, sort of numerically uh, as this, again, semi-lattice rectum over 1 minus e squared. Notice this is different than p over 1 minus e, which was the apoapse. Uh, and uh, remember, we had p of 1 plus e, which was the periapse. Right. So it's, it, it's not the same as these two because there's a little square here in terms of uh, on, on the E squared. Um, so, I, I mean, that seems like a rather arbitrary way of defining it, uh, but uh, it's, we, we do it that way 
so that the definition holds for both the ellipses and the hyperbola. Um, we'll, we'll talk about the special case of uh, ellipses uh, where it's, it's, it's easier to visualize, but, uh, we, but it, again, this definition also applies to hyperbolae. Um, <clears throat> so this formula uh, we have here is not the one we usually use. In fact, actually, we usually go the other direction. So we're usually, um, we usually, uh, we start with the semi-major axis and we use it to define the semi-lattice rectum that way. Uh, so th this is a much more commonly used formula. So this is a very useful formula. Uh, so all we've done here is we move the one minus e squared to the a term, right? Uh, so a couple things to note, of course, is that in this definition, if e is greater than zero or greater than one, sorry, that implies that, of course, the semi-major axis is less than zero, right? Because the denominator is less than zero. So in the case of a, uh, <clears throat> a hyperbola, the semi-major axis is less than zero. That's why, of course, we defined it in this sort of arbitrary way because uh, we can't really define it in a unified way and have it make much sense. I mean, what is a negative length? We can't really, we don't really have negative lengths. So we define it in this arbitrary way to get around that uh, sort of inconvenience. Of course, when uh, the eccentricity is less than one, uh, the A is greater than zero. And of course, at eccentricity equal to zero, we have a parabola, and so it's at infinity. Whether you want to think about it as plus infinity or minus infinity is your choice, but it's uh, infinity is infinity is infinity. <clears throat> right. So if we, uh, we examine the semi-major axis, look at the definition, uh, we can get uh, a very another very useful formula. Uh, so specifically, and this is a much more geometric uh, formula, although again, it holds for hyperbolae and both hyperbolae and uh, ellipses. So if we look at this expression, uh, we just, all we've done is we've taken that, uh, the formula down there. And then what we do in here is we <clears throat> expand one minus e squared uh, in terms of its factors, one minus e, uh, one plus e, <clears throat> all right, factor that out. And uh, then we use our expression, <clears throat> sorry, for uh, the radius of periaps, right, which is simply uh, remember this definition right here. So that's equal to the radius of periaps. And so we find that the semi-major axis is equal to the radius of periaps over one minus e. Again, this formulation of the, pro of the, the statement is not one we typically use. We actually usually multiply through one minus e to get the much more commonly uh, stated uh, formula for the radius of periaps as a times one minus e. Uh, if we look at, uh, well, we'll talk about this more on the next slide. Um, if we look at an ellipse, right, uh, then the semi-major axis uh, has a, a very strong uh, geometric interpretation, less strong in the case of hyperbolae, uh, but uh, again, a very strong uh, geometric interpreta interpretation um, because if we define the longest line within the ellipse, right, that's considered the major axis. And then the semi-major axis, semi meaning half, uh, is half of that longest line, right? So this distance here is the semi-major axis. So again, a very strong geometric interpretation there. So obviously this distance, which is the radius of periaps, in this distance, at least for the ellipse, which is, sorry, in the radius of ap apse, uh, <clears throat> the apoapse is longer than the semi-major axis and the periapse is shorter than the semi-major axis. So this is a very conveniently, can, easy to remember formula because the radius of periapse is the semi-major axis uh, times a factor which is small, which is less than one, uh, one minus e. Uh, and we'll see uh, shortly that the apoapse is one plus e. So this is a formula, these are formula which are easy to remember because we have minus e when it's shorter and plus e when it's longer. So again, very important formula there. <clears throat>
uh, that uh, geometric interpretation of the ellipse uh, it has is different for the hyperbola, although you can sort of intuit it if you like. Um, of course, the semi-major axis for hyperbola is negative, so right, you have to be a little bit careful, so we should really put the absolute value there. Uh, but actually, so in a hyperbola, right, we don't have those, uh, we, have, we, we, we still have foci, so the foci in a parabola over here. Uh, so the, in a parabola, uh, the semi-major axis, right, we can't really draw this major axis, right, it, it doesn't really exist. Uh, but we can sort of maybe stretch out an interpretation of that, which is the distance from, I guess, uh, the periapse to uh, this uh, distance on a the vacant orbit. So there's a vacant orbit in hyperbolae. And so the semi-major axis is half of that difference. Uh, alternatively, right, if you draw out the asymptotes of the hyperbola and find where they meet in the center point, right, uh, it's the distance from the center point to the point of closest approach. So, okay, um, that tells us something, I suppose. Uh, so, and then we also have a, a little bit of uh, this, this C here, which is the distance from the center point to the focus, as opposed to the periapse, um, C over A equals eccentricity, uh, so C equals A times E. So in the, uh, in the ellipse, this distance here was AE, the distance from the center of the ellipse to the focus. In this case, uh, in the hyperbolic case, uh, AE is the distance from the center of these asymptotes to uh, the, uh, the focus of the ellipse. Right? So slightly different um, interpretation, but it's sort of, uh, sort of similar in, in, in many respects. Uh, now let's uh, let's uh, restrict ourselves to the uh, elliptical orbits here. And again, right, uh, being very careful on which of these slides apply to elliptic orbits only. There's only been one of them so far. This is the second one. Uh, it's the second one because again we're back dealing with apoapse. Um, so if you remember our uh, expression for apoapse, we can now uh, express this uh, more conveniently uh, in the same way we did before. Um, in terms of the semi-major axis. So if we have p over 1 minus e, uh, then right, we can uh, express p equals a 1 minus e squared over 1 minus e. Factor out this 1 minus e plus 1, 1 plus e. And then these two terms cancel, and we get a 1 plus e. Okay. So that formula that I gave you on the previous slide uh, has, is very, again, has, is derived uh, using this expression for apoapse. So we have this very nice expression, apoapse is a 1 plus e. So it's the semi-major axis plus or multiplied by some factor which is greater than 1. So uh, again, now looking at this ellipse, uh, what do we got here? Uh, we've got uh, uh, periapse, radius of periapse, which is a one uh, minus e. We have this distance to apoapse. Oops. I'm not as good as drawing curly brackets as I should be. A uh, one plus e. And now we can combine these expressions if we like. We can do it directly, or we can do it using this expression here. If we look at the semi-major axis, right, this is the definition of semi-major axis. Uh, if we expand this term, do a, uh, what's called a, um, uh, um, oh, what's a, the word? Um, a factor, when you factor a, a ratio in terms of its, uh, its common roots, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a control thing. Uh, we learn it at some point. Uh, you can do that here, right? The, remember the roots of this are one minus e, uh, one plus e. And so we can factor those out, find the, the numerators for both of those terms, and it's uh, one half p in both cases. And of course, this term is the uh, radius of periapse, and this term here is the radius of apoapse. 
And so we find that the semi-major axis is the radius of periapse plus the radio of, radius of apoapse divided by two, which should surprise uh, precisely no one, right? Because of what we've already said. Uh, if we add this length to this length, we get the entire major axis. And then the semi-major axis is half of the major axis. And so uh, it, it just makes intuitive sense here that the semi-major axis is the entire axis just divided by two, right? Very useful formula right there, right? So uh, I think this is uh, most of our, uh, our, our key relationships. I mean, uh, I guess one more, you can write the distance from the center to the focus. You can get that as well uh, because you have this A here and we know that this distance, this, this distance is A one minus E. And so what's left over uh, when you, so this whole distance is A. Sorry, going a bit crazy here on my notes. Right, this whole distance here is A, and so clearly this, uh, this, the part that's left over there must be AE. So the AE is the distance from the focus to the center of the ellipse. Right. So uh, summarizing now uh, our use, very useful formula, we can uh, solve for um, uh, the, both geometric uh, invariants of the ellipse, specifically A and E, uh, given various types of measurements, for, so for example, given the apoapse and the eccentricity, we can find those, or given the periapse and the eccentricity, we can find those. Um, so we can go back and forth between their various of the geometric uh, constants, and the two that were mostly uh, used to parameterize the ellipse, which is A and E. Although occasionally we use P and A, and occasionally we use P and E. Those are good as well. Uh, for their own reasons, um, which I discussed on a previous slide. Uh, some uh, key formulae from this uh, little discussion here before we move on. Uh, very important expression for periapse, apoapse, uh, semi-lattice rectum, um, semi-major axis, and this, uh, which is really a definition, uh, how to get the semi-lattice rectum from angular momentum. Uh, notice that these two, of course, only apply to ellipses, so don't try and apply these to hyperbolae, but these others you can, you can apply to hyperbolae, these three. So keep that in mind. Only two slides uh, that we've gone over don't apply to ellipses. So now what we've shown is, uh, well, we, in, in some depth, is the shape of the ellipse, uh, its various important points, uh, various sort of geometric relationships, uh, radius of apoapse, radius of periapse, semi-lattice rectum, um, and semi-major axis, right? Uh, and we've shown that, of course, given angular momentum, h squared over mu, that gives you the semi-lattice rectum. Uh, but of course, the semi-lattice rectum is not enough information to determine both uh, orbital elements, A and E, because that's A1 minus E squared. And so, right, uh, you can't just get from, semi, from the semi-lattice rectum to both of those numbers. We need some additional information. So in this, uh, in this slide, uh, we'll talk about the very important relationship between energy and semi-major axis, and this is a very important one. Um, so specifically, we're going to take energy and use that combined with semi-major axis to get both of our orbital elements A and E. So if we think back to lecture two now uh, for our expression for energy, here it is. Combination of kinetic energy and potential, T and V. Uh, potential energy being negative, kinetic energy being positive. Uh, let's now take this formula and see if we see what we can do with it. Right. So specifically, let's take one particular point in the orbit, and this point uh, is, is valid for both hyperbolae and uh, ellipses, which is the periapse. So specifically, let's think about the energy of the orbit at the periapse. So energy 
at periapse, which is of course a one minus e. Right. So, okay, let's think about that. Um, so if we have our orbit here, what's going on, right? Uh, so we're moving in our orbit, uh, moving along. And what's special, why did we choose the periapse? Well, of course we have an expression for distance of the periapse, but we also have one for apoapse and a lot of these other points. So why do we choose periapse? Uh, we chose periapse because primarily uh, the uh, velocity vector at periapse is perpendicular to the uh, radius, right? So the position vector is perpendicular to the velocity vector, right? Because the velocity vector is here headed out and here it's headed in and it's turning and at periapse it's precisely orthogonal to the radius vector at the periapse. Right. And why is that important? Uh, because it allows us to relate in this way uh, velocity, which is comes into our uh, expression for energy, to angular momentum. Right. Velocity to angular momentum. Uh, so specifically, uh, the angular momentum at the periapse right, is the distance, rp, times the velocity, vp. Right? So uh, velocity times distance, right? So we can get, we could have done that at apoapse, but of course, uh, hyperbolae don't have apoapses, so that's why we didn't do it. Uh, so that's important because it allows us to express the velocity in terms of the um, angular momentum and rp, of course, uh, but uh, that, that hopefully won't cause us too much grief. Uh, and then, of course, we have the angular momentum itself can be expressed in terms of, uh, again, the semi-lattice rectum along with this uh, gravitational constant mu, which, of course, varies with the central body. All right. So let's take all that information uh, and now plug it into this expression for energy. Uh, so first of all, uh, we're going to take uh, this periapse, this is the easy part, uh, and we have an expression for periapse, so we just plug that in, right? A equals our radius of periapse. Uh, slightly more complicated, however, is our expression for V squared. So let's take a look at V squared, VP squared. Well, there's two parts to this, right? So VP is uh, H over uh, RP, as we discussed, RP. RP is, of course, a 1 minus e, right? Uh, this is uh, squared, of course, so we get the a squared over 1 minus e squared on the denominator. And h, well, what is h? Um, well, h, remember, we can express, we found in terms of the uh, p and mu. So, actually, I shouldn't say squared yet, uh, squared of p and mu. And so now when we square this expression for velocity, right, all of these things get squared. And so we square this, we square this, and on the numerator, just the uh, square root disappears. And so we have this expression for V squared, uh, which is P mu over A squared one minus E squared. We can express, uh, we can uh, expand that out a little bit more uh, using our expression for P, right? Uh, a one minus E squared, right? Still got our mu in there over a squared one minus e squared. And that's what we're doing right here, right? Using our expression for p, where is that? Um, that's p. And uh, now we can do a couple things. Well, first of all, we can uh, cancel out our a's, right? Uh, the next thing that we can do is uh, expand out one minus e squared in terms of its factors. So one minus e, uh, one plus e. Right? So that's uh, 1 minus e, uh, 1 plus e. And then we have uh, two 1 minus e's on the denominator, so we can get rid of one of those and cross scratch out that. And so we now get an expression for uh, um, the energy, uh, at least on the left, which is uh, there's this 1 half term. Uh, all we have left on the numerator is, is 1 plus e. And on the denominator, we have a times one minus e, a one minus e. Now on the right-hand side, let's not forget about the right-hand side. Uh, now our denominators are almost identical except for the one half, so that we moved one half into the numerator. And so, so now our denominators are identical, so we can just subtract off mu, 
And we'll just pull out that, since everything multiplies by mu, we'll pull out the entire factor of mu there. And so our numerator now looks like 1 half 1 plus e minus 1. Uh, and now we'll, we can say that uh, this uh, minus 1 is 1 half times 2, right? And so when we pull that 1 half factor out of both of these terms, right, we get a minus 2 here, drop it out there. And so we get uh, negative 2 plus e uh, minus, plus 1. And so uh, we get that this is just minus 1 plus e, or e minus 1. And uh, e minus 1 is, of course, the negative of 1 minus e. And so those two terms cancel out. And all we're left with is just the negative sign there. And so everything at this point is canceled out. And we're, so all we're left with is that factor on the outside mu and this a, which we never managed to cancel out, and the factor 1 half here. Right? So the entire expression for energy now has collapsed, at least at the uh, periaps, uh, to be negative mu over 2a. Right, a very simple expression for energy at the periaps. But of course, energy is invariant, and so this is the expression for energy of the orbit at any point. We've just calculated it at periaps. It just happens to be applied to everywhere in the orbit. And so now this is a very important expression for the total energy of the orbit, which is, of course, the combination of kinetic plus potential, uh, this expression here. Uh, the important point, of course, is that we now have the, a one-to-one -one relationship between a physical invariant, which is energy, and a geometric invariant, which is semi-major actions. Uh, semi-major actions, so physical invariant, and a geometric invariant. Right? This allows us to go back and forth between semi-major axis and energy. And, of course, this expression allows us to go back and forth between uh, angular momentum and semi-lattice rectum. So this is often why uh, it's very convenient to think of your ellipse uh, in terms of P and A as opposed to E and A uh, because there's uh, this one-to-one -one relationship between angular momentum and semi-lattice semi, and semi rectum and energy and semi-major axis. Right. Right, you can go back and forth very quickly. Right. So uh, let's see, uh, once, uh, once we, we've Taken, when we, we go back and forth between P and A and E and A, or P, sorry, P and H and A and E, uh, we can then, of course, uh, get, uh, bring eccentricity back in uh, without, of course, calculating the eccentricity vector, which is a major pain. Uh, because we have, uh, with A, we have this relationship P equals A1 minus E squared, which we can then solve for E. So we can solve for E is equal to the square root of 1 minus p over a. All right, so again, that's a very important formula. I should probably have highlighted it here. All right. So again, uh, angular momentum, get p, energy, get a, and then use this formula to get eccentricity. All right. So we can, now we can go back and forth between a and e and which are geometric invariants, and our physical invariants, which are angular momentum and energy. And again, this applies to both hyperbolae and elliptic orbits. Because we used the periaps to calculate this information, uh, this uh, works for both cases. Uh, notice, of course, here, uh, energy, right? It has a negative sign, so energy is negative. Um, that if we remember that when you're in an elliptic orbit, if you're in orbit, you're in the gravity well of the, the planet. And hence, if you're in orbit, if you're in an elliptic orbit, right, uh, we don't really consider a hyperbolic orbit to be an orbit per se, because it doesn't repeat, uh, your energy is negative. So E is negative for an ellipse. And that makes sense here now because uh, for an ellipse, A is a positive number. However, for a hyperbola, E is positive. And again, that makes sense because uh, for a hyperbola, remember, by our definition of semi-major axis, the uh, semi-major axis is negative. Hyperbola. Uh, in this case, uh, A is uh, negative. And in this case, A is positive. 
So the sine of A is opposite of the sine of energy. Right. So now we can uh, use this energy relationship in particular to uh, solve some very important problems through a very well-known, uh, well very famous formula called the Visviva equation. So, okay, how do we do this, right? This is actually an equation which allows you to uh, calculate some things about the orbit without ever having to go uh, to deal with, say, uh, eccentricity or uh, angular momentum. So it's a strictly energy-based calculation. We had sort of some hint on that in the uh, second lecture when we were talking about energy uh, as an invariant quantity and did some calculations there as well. Uh, but we didn't have this. Uh, we didn't have this important expression at that point because, of course, we didn't have semi-major axis at that point. But it, it was implicit in there in that calculation. Anyway, so not to belabor the point. Uh, so we have an expression for uh, the energy of an orbit, and we also have an expression for what the definition of energy is. And so the Visviva equation is is really just a uh, phrasing of that express that relationship where uh, we solve this equation for v right so we uh, we pull v out so let's see we just move mu to the other side over here uh, plus mu over r and uh, multiply by two so there's a two there and that two gets disappears there and so we just have an expression for v squared is mu uh, so we pull out the factor mu here. Uh, can, that's one. Uh, mu times two over r, which comes from here, and one over a, which comes from here. Okay. So this relationship, this expression for velocity, right, uh, allows us to translate directly from radius to velocity. Uh, knowing nothing more about the orbit than the semi-major axis. So we only need to know semi-major axis, uh, not eccentricity, in order to do these calculations. Why vis viva is very important. It uses limited information about the orbit to calculate important observational quantities such as velocity. And again, uh, we can, uh, going back to lecture two, at the, the, those calculations at the very end, for escape velocity, uh, we can go a little bit beyond that, talk about excess velocity. So that's the velocity once you've escaped the gravity well of the planet. Uh, so here's a gravity well. So uh, if energy is positive, you have some excess velocity once you've left the gravity well of the planet, and we can now calculate what that is. So in particular, as we let r go to infinity, right, as we get farther and farther away to the, from the planet, uh, we'll have some leftover velocity that which didn't get used up escaping from the, the planet. We can now calculate what that is by plugging in infinity here, and then this term goes to zero, and we just have v squared equals mu negative mu over a. And we, uh, we find the, the square root of that, and so we got an expression for excess velocity uh, once you've left the gravity well of the planet, which is nothing more than just mu over a. Uh, note, of course, this uh, you have a square root of a negative number, uh, so this uh, excess velocity only is, is only real when we're in a hyperbolic orbit, so energy greater than zero, hence uh, semi-major axis less than zero. So this only works for hyperbole, not for ellipses. So this is one of those formulae only for hyperbole. We'll talk about hyperbolas uh, in a separate lecture uh, in a little bit more depth. Um, right now, uh, there's uh, various interesting things about hyperbolae, which we're not going to get into today. So very, again, two extremely important equations. Uh, well, I don't know if excess of velocity is extremely important, but very important. Uh, the vis viva equation is very important, and the energy uh, calculation equation is very important as well. So uh, now that we've gone through most of the uh, most of the uh, the formula that we're going to go through in part B here, I'll just sort of close out uh, our discussion 
with a discussion of circular orbits. So of course in a circular orbit, right, uh, it's a very special case where uh, eccentricity is zero. And so uh, in the case of a circular orbit, you have uh, the uh, the radius of periapse equals the radius of apoapse, or you can just use the polar equation to find that the distance is a constant at all times, which is of course just the semi-major axis of the orbit. So in this case, uh, r and a are the same value, so we can just plug in r as the uh, distance from the uh, center of the orbit. And uh, we can find a very nice and convenient and very widely used formula for the, uh, the velocity of a circular orbit as uh, square root of mu over r. All right. So just uh, we subtract 2 over r minus 1 over r, that's just 1 over r. Right? And then we have v squared equals mu over r, and that's it. Right? v squared equals mu over r. Take the square root, and we have our expression for v. Um, important, uh, very important equation gets a lot of intuition in this equation. Uh, so specifically, if we look at this equation, uh, we look at orbits around the Earth, right? for example, orbits around the Earth. Uh, what we see is that the velocity uh, of that orbit right, increases as the size of the orbit decreases. So a, short, a smaller orbit has larger velocity. So that would add like v equals 2, well, maybe... 2 is too short. Um, uh, v equals like 8. And here at a larger orbit, we have v equals, uh, say, 4 or something like that. So the, lo the farther you are out, the greater your distance in your circular orbit generally, or any orbit really, uh, from the central body, the slower you're going to be moving. This often confuses people because higher orbits are actually, right, e equals... Uh, negative square root of mu over 2a, which is a similar expression, right? right? These, are, these look vaguely similar, right? But they're really opposite in meaning, <laughs> uh, in a way. Uh, so there's a negative sign here, right? So the higher the orbit, right, the higher the a, right, the smaller the value of energy, but since this energy is negative, uh, that means actually the more energy you have. So these higher orbits, uh, high, have higher orbit, uh, higher A, they also have higher energy, but they have lower velocity. Lower velocity. Uh, whereas the smaller orbits, right, have uh, lower radius or semi-major axis, lower energy, like more negative energy, and higher velocities. Right? So this is, uh, this is confusing because you would think if, a more, if the orbit is more energetic, it would have smaller velocity. But this is not true, actually. Uh, it's just because the potential energy of that orbit uh, is, hot, is lower, right? So you've, you've lost a lot of potential energy going from here to here. And all of that has been translated to kinetic energy. There are other ways of thinking about this. And in fact, uh, if you think uh, the, the, historically, people often thought about uh, the velocity of an orbit in terms of centripetal acceleration. So remember, uh, gravity, uh, force of gravity, is proportional to uh, um, mu over r squared, right? So the force of gravity, remember, is the... Uh, um, the, the force that keeps you falling around the around your orbit. So um, I don't want to use Yavin over here. So sort of draw. Where should I draw? Draw over here, right? So as you're moving around in a circular orbit, right? You have a, a force due to gravity. I shouldn't have drawn that. Force due to gravity is moving in that direction, and if you're moving in a circle, right, around uh, around anything, right? Uh, there's an acceleration, right? A centripetal acceleration, which is omega squared r, right? So in a circular orbit, these two forces are in balance, right? Uh, the uh, 
uh, the, the force due to gravity is equal to omega squared uh, r, right, in this case. Right? So you can actually uh, derive Kepler's uh, third law from this, uh, this, this relationship between centripetal acceleration and gravity. Uh, you can divide by, I think actually I have a, uh, some notes on that, so we'll get to that in part C. But I want you to keep in mind, right, that um, as you get, as you're, get closer to the, gra to, the, to the planet, this term increases, right, the force due to gravity. And so to compensate for that, you have to move faster, right? This omega squared has to increase because, right, that's uh, the amount of centripetal acceleration you need to stay in that orbit. Right, um, so you can think of like the reason that the the orbits are moving faster is to generate more centripetal acceleration to balance the increase in gravity at these points. Right? So at these higher orbits, right, you uh, you don't have as much as centripetal acceleration, but you also don't have as much gravity to balance that. Right? Anyway, uh, so that's uh, that's that discussion. And uh, I'll just bring it back to the uh, to the to Star Wars, of course. Um, if you uh, if you remember the Battle of Yavin, uh, so there's uh, Yavin here, and there's a moon. Uh, I think that's actually Yavin Four. It's the moon of Yavin. Yavin's actually over here somewhere. Um, and uh, there's uh, the Death Star over here, and there's the hidden Rebel base. Hidden Rebel Base over here, and uh, some uh, the the Death Star drops into orbit uh, on the far side of the the moon Yavin, the Yavin Moon. I think it's I think it's the moon. Anyway, it's a big big planet. No, maybe that's Endor. I'm thinking of. Anyway, it's uh, I think it's Yavin Four. I'm not not a. Don't quote me on that. Anyway, it drops on the wrong side, uh, and so there's uh, the scene where. Uh, the uh, commanding officer on the Death Star uh, is berating his subordinate, saying, "You idiot! You've dropped us too close to the planet." Right, which is technically true, right? So I guess, it, but that, that's not the point, right? The, that he dropped it too close to the planet. If he dropped it to, to the planet over here, uh, you'd still be able to shoot down the the, the rebel moon. Um, by dropping uh, the the Death Star close to the planet, actually. Uh, he's ensured that the uh, the velocity of the Death Star is faster than the velocity of the the. I, I guess this is the the Rebel base on Yavin. This is Yavin Four. So okay. this is Yavin, and this is Yavin Four. There we go. Anyway, so uh, by dropping uh, the the Death Star close to the planet, he's actually ensuring that they have enough. That they're moving faster than the uh, the rebel base than the moon, on which the rebel base is landed. So they're actually ensuring if they had dropped it like uh, dropped the Death Star over here at exactly the same distance, right? Uh, they would never be able to shoot down the rebel base because they'd both be moving at exactly the same velocity, right? Um, angular velocity and linear velocity as well. But by actually dropping close to the to the to planet, they're ensuring that eventually, right? They're they they'll move faster. And so they'll move over here, and they'll eventually catch up to the hidden rebel base and be able to shoot it down. So actually, the uh, the, the the Death Star pilot uh, was very smart to drop the Death Star onto the close to the the planet. Uh, but of course, if he had managed to drop it over here, it would have been better. But berating him for dropping it too close to the Death Star was is misguided. I basically that's my point. So there's not much to know about circular orbits other than those formula, right? V equals square root of mu over r. And it's a balance between centripetal acceleration and gravity. Those are the two main, main points. Um, now we'll just go through a, a really quick example, which is sort of a variation on the one we had in lecture two. Uh, so in this case, we observe, make two observations, but we observe the geometric invariance of the orbit directly. So specifically, we observe an orbit where the point of closest approach is 15,000 kilometers, and the point of farthest approach is 25,000 kilometers, right? 
and uh, we want to know what what happens at some point in the future. We want we observe the the satellite at another time and at another distance, and we want to know its velocity. So this part of the problem is exactly the same as the problem from part uh, lecture two. Uh, the difference here, however, is that I'm giving you, actually, I'm giving you too much information, honestly, uh, because I'm giving you enough information to determine both A and E. Right? Uh, all you really need, however, is, is A. Uh, but uh, if you remember our formula for A, A is the radius of periapse plus the radius of apoapse divided by 2. And so we know periapse and apoapse uh, both of those geometric things, so we can figure out what the uh, semi-major axis is. Right there it is. So these two add up to forty thousand divided by two. We get semi-major axis of twenty thousand. I could actually also use this information to get us get me eccentricity, but since I don't need it for this problem, uh, I don't I don't calculate it. So we can now calculate directly the energy of the orbit, negative mu over two a. Uh, just plug in twenty thousand there, and we get. Uh, this is about Earth, uh, perigee, right? G tells us it's about Earth, uh, of negative uh, 10, essentially. So our energy here is negative 10. And we use that with the uh, vis viva, or actually in vis viva, we could, we could just use vis viva directly. Uh, v equals um, 2 over R minus uh, 1 over A. We could have used that directly. Uh, but in this case, actually, we calculate the, uh, the energy uh, using the energy equation, uh, solving for V here uh, without actually using this viva directly. We could have used this viva directly. Uh, okay, so then we just solve for V here and uh, in terms of energy, and uh, we get this expression here, which we calculate uh, velocity as 4.464. Right. Again, we could have just used this directly with the semi-major axis of 20,000 and an R of in this case, uh, also 20,000. And that would be uh, 2 divided by 20,000 minus 1 divided by 20,000 would just be 1 over 20,000. Uh, and of course, there's a mu here. Sorry, I forgot the mu. So in any case, um, you can use these geometric invariants to give you your, uh, your physical invariants. In this case, we used uh, A to go to E. Uh, and then that tells us about some observational in, uh, things at some future time, in particular velocity and radius. Right. Right, so uh, at this point, uh, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll go through Kepler's three laws and the derivation thereof. Uh, hopefully, you'll find the material in this lecture useful, uh, if you can get through it. And it was not too bad. Uh, and I'll see you next time.